five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. The whole thing is very, Tate, very mysterious, Valley, but this is what I know. Authorities say a menacing letter received yesterday by a Vallejo newspaper was not sent by the infamous Zodiac Killer. That's again part of his details. That Area 51, the secret Air Force base in Nevada, actually exists. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. He's been called the East Side Rapist. He's been called the Visalia Ransacker. The original Night Stalker. And the Golden State Killer. You have now entered into the house of mystery. The best in true crime, conspiracy, and alternative history. With Al Warren and Kevin Thompson. KCAA, the stations that leave no listener behind. Broadcasting on 1050 AM, 102.3 FM, and 106.5 FM. The trifecta of talk radio for Southern California. Welcome into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren, and joining me today we have some incredible people. <laughs> They're all Zodiac specialists in their own right, and we're going to be doing a little marathon here this week, and it will be heard in L.A. only, not the Seattle market. So first up is joining me is Michael Butterfield. Hello. <laughs> Hello. And uh, then we have Mike Morph. That's what we'll call him as Morph instead of Morford. How are you doing, Mike? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on now. And then uh, least, or last but not least, is uh, David Orenchak. Thank you for being here. Hey, great to be here. Okay. So let's, let's just, for the people that are new to it and are not as familiar with you guys, let's have each of you kind of do a little rundown on who you are. So let's start with Michael Butterfield. Well, I'm a writer and a researcher who's been uh, following the Zodiac case for longer than I care to admit. Um, I, I tried to track down when I first heard of the Zodiac case, and I believe it was when I was a little kid and I went to go see the movie Time After Time, which uh, some of your viewers may be familiar with. It's a great movie about uh, Jack the Ripper stealing the time machine belonging to H.G. Wells and traveling into the future in San Francisco. And in that film, a uh, police officer refers to the Zodiac. And I obviously, I had seen that movie when it came out, so that was the, probably the first time I'd ever heard of it. But I also heard about it through family friends who were uh, police officers and detectives in Phoenix, Arizona, who were homicide. And then uh, later on, I just started to look, in it, look into the case on my own. And uh, in the 1990s, I conducted some research and eventually... Uh, you know, gathered a lot of information, a lot of police reports, did a lot of interviews with people who were involved in the case, including the original investigators and some uh, families of the victims, uh, suspects, uh, people who accused suspects, and a lot of various people. But eventually I have amassed this uh, uh, collection of information and, and now have a website called ZodiacKillerFacts.com which has the Zodiac letters, police reports, FBI files, and a lot of other information about the case. And uh, I also do some true crime writing for uh, True Crime Case Files magazine and uh, some other things, but uh, the Zodiac has been my focus. You're in love with them. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then we have Michael Morford. Now, uh, we'll call you Morph so people don't get mixed up. Uh, you've been doing a lot of stuff uh, lately. Um, let's, let's talk about your history. Yeah, so I became familiar with the Zodiac case back when I was in high school. I did a book report on it, and it just sort of took off from there. I had some interest, and then the Internet came along, and I was really able to dive in and find different sites and different bits of information online that I didn't have access to, and it sort of, sort of really started from there. And along the way, I made some you know contacts. I reached out to some people that I you know read about in reports, and I figured – you know, they're not going to punch me in the face over the over the phone if I call them. So I just reached out to some people, made some contacts, and some people opened up to me and started talking and sharing stuff with me. And then I, you know, I made some contacts with law enforcement investigating the case. And, you know, in reading a lot of the reports, especially the FBI files, I constantly see a lot of material that the FBI had examined in relation to the Zodiac case that wasn't out there. So I 
did some Freedom of Information Act request, you know, through the Department of Justice and was able to get a lot of documents released. Um, you know, I'm not a big book reader, but reading through reports and FBI files, you know, hundreds of them I don't mind doing. Uh, so that was, that was a fun experience. Um, but I do run a Zodiac site called ZodiacKillerSite.com. I've had that for several years. And I also do some true crime podcasting and, and uh, writing, blogging, etc. You just did a uh, Zodiac uh, podcast, didn't you? A series. Yeah, my podcast, Criminology, just covered uh, the Zodiac case in depth uh, in uh, Season 1. Interesting. And now we have also David Orenchak. Now, um, this is the first time on the show. Welcome. And uh, let's talk about you. Where, where What's your tie to the Zodiac? So my background is I'm uh, a, a big computer geek. So I've been programming computers since I was in about second grade. And so about 11 years ago, I came across the um, uh, the Zodiac ciphers online. Um, I forget where I saw them originally, but I, it appealed to me because you know no one has solved three out of the four ciphers. And because I'm so interested in computer programming and solving puzzles and that sort of thing, uh, it really uh, appealed to me. So uh, I thought, well, you know, why don't I use my programming skills to try to come up with techniques to attack this cipher, which unfortunately is a trap that many other programmers have fallen into, you know, and they've uh, tried in vain to, to crack the, the 340 especially. Um, you know, one of the four, one of the uh, three unsolved zodiac ciphers, and um, you know that that's one angle that I've been uh, exploring with the ciphers is coming up with um, software, developing my own software to attack them. But also, uh, the other thing was when I first saw the ciphers, you know, I was spending a lot of time trying to find information about them because you know, uh, you know, other people have worked on them over the years and have documented information about what they've found and you know, clues and observations and experiments they've run and so forth. But that kind of information was, was difficult to find because, you know, there's so much commentary and speculation and weird theories and, you know, conspiracies and really nutty stuff that, that kind of pollutes the case. So I started a, a site called uh, ZodiacKillerCiphers.com as an attempt to organize all of the what I thought was factual information, you know, and have it posted in one place, so it'd be a resource for researchers that are trying to uh, work on the ciphers. Um, so over these over the last eleven years or so, I've been trying to kind of curate all of the very specific cipher related information and put it on my site. Um, eventually. I organized a lot of this material into presentations that I gave at the uh, NSA's um, symposium, which they have every two years. It's put on by their um, Center for Cryptologic History. And so they have a lot of interesting presentations about, um, you know, code-breaking history. And a lot of it pertains to, you know, wartime ciphers and things like that. But they also have a lot of presentations about ciphers and crime. So... Uh, Zodiac was a good fit there. Um, and I've made a bunch of different little software tools to help other researchers, you know, exploring different aspects about the ciphers. I also spend a lot of time looking at um, solution claims. People will send me what they think is their, you know, final solution for the cipher. You know, a lot of people are very convinced that they have the correct answer to the to the unsolved cipher. So I like to look at the solutions and you know try to see you know, if they've gotten it right or where they've gone wrong with their reasoning. And, you know, so far, none of the solutions have uh, proven to be correct. Um, they usually have some fatal problem that prevents them from be being verified. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, and I spent a lot of time looking at uh, the crypto materials that may have been available in Zodiac's time because maybe those will be hints into how he may have made his ciphers, and uh, yeah, I work with uh, other researchers that, you know, a lot of them are on Morph's forum, 
and they're very active there, building their own software tools and exchanging notes, comparing notes, and um, trying out a lot of different interesting ideas. And um, and I'm also working to build some crypto software for the um, FBI's Crypt Analysis and Racketeering Records Unit, the CRRU for short, doing a little bit of contract work on the side for them. Um, so uh, that's I think that's pretty much it from from my background. Was that it? No. I try. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you were programming computers when you were two years old. You make me feel like a slacker. Well, <laughs> well at that time, at that time, well, I wasn't you know writing the programs. I was typing them in because they used to publish them in magazines. Oh wow! That's, that's how I discovered programming because I stayed after school. They had this you know fancy computer thing <laughs> in the early eighties or whatever. And they had a computer magazine, and you know, I looked, and there was a program in there for I don't know, it did some kind of like graphics display thing, like a cool little animation or something like that. And so you just, you know, in those days they didn't just distribute the programs on discs, or you couldn't just download it. So you'd have to sit there with a the magazine and type the program in, you know, line by line, and make sure you know, pray that you didn't make a typo. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what got that's what got me hooked was that you could type all this nonsense and then suddenly the computer would do something interesting. Mm. Wow. Okay. Well, and now all of your sites are up on the website too. So anybody listening, you can just uh, click on either either of their sites. Um, and uh, why do you think like this is this is kind of a free for all? As it's an introduction. Why do you think there's so much um, enthusiasm? Let's say. For Zodiac, and why has it stayed with us so long? And 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 as we were talking before, there's a lot of passion behind it, and a lot of um, like people take their theories real serious, and uh, really get um, uptight. <laughs> I'll say that because you know, because I'm from the outside. I'm not part of that. I'm part of the crime scene you know but um i'm not an, an, an enthusiast to the to the degree that um uh, that you guys are but not, not so much that but you know you guys have all been around and there's a lot of people that i've had on the show and a lot of people i've talked to and a lot of letters i get <laughs> and uh they're quite extensive and they're quite um they're quite upsetting in a, in a sense that there's a lot of um I'm just going to say passion. What do you think that is? Like, what's the cause for this? Well, if you don't mind me uh, jumping in first there, I think it's kind of twofold. First of all, Zodiac's a fascinating story. I mean, the fact that the killer hasn't been caught is just one of the fascinating aspects of it. I always say, you know, there aren't too many serial killers who wear bizarre hooded costumes with their chosen symbols on the chest like some sort of comic book villain. There aren't a lot of serial killers who quote from Gilbert and Sullivan musicals or write letters, you know, complaining about The Exorcist being a satirical comedy and things like that. Um, the crimes themselves are fascinating and horrifying and terrifying. Um, the killer's behavior is bizarre in the annals of true crime. But I think, like many unsolved mysteries, you know, the lack of an answer just invites a, it just creates this vacuum where people want to interject their own ideas, they project their own images of the killer and things like that. But people who think they've solved the case or think they've found the solution to a cipher, you know, a lot of them are suffering from a degree of confirmation bias or other issues, but they, many of them are absolutely convinced that they're right. I, I believe there are some people out there who who know they're kind of just peddling some nonsense for you know, money or fame or what have you, but most of them seem genuinely convinced that they're right. Now, whether or not they have good reasons for what they believe, that's another story, but I think there's something about an unsolved case that invites everybody to play detective, and some people take it a little too seriously. Yeah, and there's a, there's a certain rush of... Uh that, that happens when you think that you've, you've discovered something new. I know I felt that towards the beginning of my cipher research when I was trying to, to crack the, the cipher. Um, you know, every once in a while, my program would spit out something that looks like it could be on the right track. It could be vaguely, you know, a threatening statement from Zodiac or some creepy statement or some key words. And when I would see them, I would feel like 
this rush of excitement that I've like maybe I'm onto something, you know, unraveling this this code that's been a mystery for forty forty years. And but you know, upon verification, you know, they didn't turn out to be anything. But you know, not not everyone stops there. They feel that rush of discovery and then they they don't recognize why it may not be the real thing. And so they don't have the, you know, the filter that tells them, oh, you know, that those words that you found, you know, that might just be a coincidence. It might just be, you know, like seeing faces in the clouds. They're not, mm -hmm. they're not put there on purpose by, a, by, you know, somebody who makes clouds. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's just random, you know, and your brain is picking up on patterns. And so I think that, you know, the emotional component of it, when you feel like you're onto something, I think that can really overtake people and, you know, it can propel them towards some conclusion that might not be right. You're right about that being an addictive thing or a powerful emotion. I think many, many, many years ago, when I thought I was onto something with some of the Zodiac map information, um, I thought I had found something. And, of course, if you're lucky, that second part kicks in that makes you question it. <laughs> and you stop and go, well, I should really check this out. And I eventually discovered that what I thought was there was, was not right. But most people don't stop to question it. And I, I know, you know, Dave and Morph and I all get many emails from people who claim to have solved the case or found the solution to a cipher. And it doesn't it doesn't usually matter what you say to them. It doesn't deter them in any way. They're, they're convinced that they're right. And you're lucky if you get somebody who's willing to listen to some valid criticisms or observations about why what they're proposing may not be accurate. Yeah, and I think, you know, everybody loves a, a big mystery, and that's what this case is. And a lot of people spend too much time, I think all of us were probably guilty of spending too much time on this case, um, and we're not alone. A lot of other people have spent countless hours, you know, investing in it. And when they t latch on to something, it's hard to let go of that. And I think people, you know, will tie an anchor around themselves and attach themselves to a theory or to a suspect or, or whatever and then just not deviate from that, you know, for better or for worse. Um so I think that comes into play, and, and a lot of people come forward with their theories, with their suspects, whatever. And, you know, I think I think Mike and Dave will probably attest to this, but, you know, Mike sort of touched on it. We get all kinds of emails from people that, um, with some pretty decent theories, with some pretty decent suspects, but then there's there's some people that, I, I don't, sometimes I think they're joking with me. You know, they're, they're <laughs> sending, you know, they're sending me, Oh, I think Clint Eastwood was the Zodiac. And I'm like, yeah. really? And, and, or I think uh, the guys that escaped from Alcatraz made it, and they want, they became a Zodiac team. And yeah. and I, I'm actually asking myself, are these guys actually, is this person serious? Are they really sending that to me? Or, or is, is it a really performance art or something? That's the popular one. But it, it's, it's funny when you see... And the funny thing is that when I talk to some of the investigators on the case, they get the same stuff we do multiply times ten probably. Oh, yeah. um, but, you know, there's just this subset of people out there, and some people are, you know, have good, do good work and have some good ideas. Um, but unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't, and they, you know, they're out there too, and sometimes their voices are louder than everybody else's. And it's also about a standard, you know, like, uh, all of us, we, we get these emails from people and they claim that someone's the Zodiac and of course the first thing that you do is you say, well, where's the evidence to support this? If you don't have legitimate or even basic standards, it's really easy to become convinced by something. So if you, it only takes a little bit of information, a little bit of trivia or something to make, to convince you that something's right, then you know, the the more information you get that says it's wrong is not really going to matter because you've already made up your mind. Fake yeah, that news. Happens. Yeah, fake news. <laughs> that happens a lot with the ciphers. Well, well, well people will, um, you know, the one thing that's very powerful to people who promote theories is the uh, aggregation of um, coincidences that they discover. 
Mm-hmm. So you know, the combination of circumstantial evidence that they, you know, this, the, the, to support a particular suspect, you know, that's one angle. But they apply that as well to the ciphers and, you know, we'll find things about the ciphers that link to that particular suspect. It could be, you know, a name or a fragment of a name or, you know, some, some phrase or word that's connected to that suspect in some way, you know, some personal detail, a birthday or something like that. And, you know, we'll hunt for these, these coincidences and, you know, one is not enough. So they'll keep going and, and find more. And then the more that they find, the more convinced they are that they're on the right track. Even though they could follow the same exercise for another suspect and produce a, you know, equally compelling pile of coincidences generated from the ciphers. And that, you know, that tells you what the, what the problem is, which is that it's too easy to create these coincidences. Well, and coincidences happen a lot. I mean, we were just talking the other night, the three of us, about at uh, Lake Berryessa, when a fisherman saw the victims and then went to report what had happened, he went to a boat repair shop. And the boat repair shop was run by a couple with the last name White. And the person that ended up going to the lake responding to the crime with them was also named White. But they weren't related. They had nothing to do with each other. And then I was reading a book the other day about the about Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker killer. And I don't know if, how, if your uh, listeners are familiar with this, but when he was identified in the newspapers, he was uh, basically chased down by an angry mob in the streets of L.A. And one of the very first police officers who responded to the scene was named Ramirez. I mean, you know, that, that somebody else looks at that and that means something, that's something important. And when it comes to the people with their Zodiac theories, that kind of trivia becomes a major component in their theory. Yeah. I, I, one of the biggest things that I've come across has been, and, and you've probably heard this a lot too, is the idea that, um, you know, since the Golden State killer was caught by DNA, that this is going to be the way Zodiac is eventually caught. Do you guys have a thought on that? Um, is this is this a possibility, or is this something we? It's just gone. It's too long. Well, I think it's certainly possible. I mean, it's you know, Mike knows. Mike's been talking with a lot of uh, investigators over the years about. The, how committed they are. They really want to find out who the Zodiac was, and this might be the best shot they have. Now, the fact that we haven't heard anything in the media about it doesn't mean anything. I think some people are jumping to the conclusion that it should have happened by now, they should have wrapped this up, we should have heard about it, when in reality, if the investigators are being responsible about this, they're going to spend their time chasing down every little piece of information they can, verifying what they can, and they're not going to make any public statements about anything until they have something solid to report or they have solved the case. They're, the fact that we haven't heard anything isn't in and of itself some evidence that it, it failed or it can't work. Yeah, and I think since the Golden State Killer was arrested, everybody hears, oh, they have DNA. It's just a, it's an automatic... Uh, certainty that the case is going to be solved and that's not true because it, with Zodiac we don't know that whatever DNA they have is definitely from him it could have been you know a letter carrier uh, somebody handling a letter uh, you know a hair comes off their hand and gets under a stamp or someplace on the envelope that kind of stuff but I think now what they're trying to do is, is like in the Golden State Killer case they're trying to develop a sample based on the letters that they do have, you know, uh, maybe from the glue under the envelope flaps, etc., cetera, um, to develop a sample that's good enough to go into JetMatch, into the database that caught the Golden State Killer, and then they can use genealogy to track any potential relatives they come across and, and narrow that down to a suspect. But the, the key is, is that sample that they have good enough to work with uh, you know, I think years ago when they tested that DNA, well, it's, it's been 10, 15 years ago now, when they tested the last Zodiac DNA sample, that was like a night and day difference from what they can do now. Yeah, um, it's very different today than what they had back then. Yeah, the advances, the technology. So I think they can do more with less now, and they can do uh, more with 
samples that might not be ideal um, that they couldn't do years ago. And I, I really think that, as we're seeing in the news, every week there's a case being solved with this. I really think this lit a fire under some people, and they said, look, let's finally try and clear this case off, off the books. Um, and, and I think that's going to lead to, to hopefully a good sample being developed that can be put in that, in that database and then hopefully genealogy will track it to the right person. Yeah, I think Mike will attest to this too. Uh, you know, you often hear people online saying things like, the police don't want to solve this case or they don't care or whatever. And uh, the, the people who are in charge of this case, they do care. And if you were assigned to a case like this, and you had an opportunity to possibly solve the case by following this example in the Golden State Killer case, you would pursue it. I mean, I, Mike, if, if you were in charge of the case and someone came to you and said, hey, there's a way that you might be able to find some DAA on this letter and then we might be able to use it to track down persons belonging to this family and maybe narrow it down to the killer, you would say yes. I mean, it's a question of you know resources and money and whatever, but... I, I don't believe that any of the investigators assigned to this case in San Francisco or Vallejo or anywhere else don't want to solve this case. And so the fact that they're not communicating with us in through, you know, social media or, or uh, other reporting doesn't mean that they're not doing anything. It just means that they're probably being responsible and waiting until they have something solid to report. Yeah, I agree with that. One of the big things we've come across is uh, we just did a show with John Cameron and Paramount did that series on Ed Edwards. Now, they insist that he was the Zodiac. And, and uh, you know, the thing is, like, uh, I go out and I'm somewhere, somewhere at a store or someplace and people come up to me and say, oh, did you hear? So Ed Edwards was Zodiac. Is, th is that true, do you think? Um is this a good thing or a bad thing, these shows that come out? Mike, you want to take that? Yeah, I personally, uh, I mean, it's it, it goes both ways. It, it keeps attention on the case. A younger generation that might not know as much about the case can learn about it and hear about it. But at the same time, I think it puts a lot of bogus information out there. Um, and, you know, that sort of you know, clouds the, the waters about what's true and what's not. And and some people, they see it on TV, so it must be true. Yeah. Uh, and that's and that's not always the case. Yeah. Wait, Mike, are you saying that things on TV are not true? Is that, is that what you're saying? And no comment. I'm yeah. shocked. Well, at this point, it's, got, it's gotten to be like the Zodiac case has become this kind of mythic uh, American story. Mm -hmm. that he was the boogeyman that was never caught. Yeah. And so, you know, as a kid, you hear those stories and, you know, scares the bejesus out of you. And then it kind of expands from there. And, you know, you know, anyone could be Zodiac. You know, it could be somebody's father. It could be, you know, Ed Edwards. It could be, you know, whoever. And over the years, because there's been so much misinformation around it, it's become kind of like a, you know, uh, a mythological thing like, uh, like all the UFO stories. Mm -hmm. And, um, the grassy knoll. Yeah, 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 that kind of stuff. It just takes a life of its own, and people, like m m like Michael was saying earlier, about people projecting their ideas into it, that's kind of what myths are. You know, it becomes this pop culture thing where, you know, everyone can kind of just do their own remix or mashup of the case to suit their, you know, perspective. Well, it's a blank canvas, so you can just put whatever you want there. And I think also... The fact that it's it's like the Jack the Ripper case in the sense that the more the more the mystery endures and the more it becomes unreachable in some ways, the more it starts to absorb all these other parts of pop culture and things. So you have the Zodiac is connected to the Manson family or the CIA MK Ultra mind control projects or satanic cults or in the Edward Wayne Edwards case, you know he's responsible for, I don't know, every major crime in America and probably took the Lindbergh baby, too. And it, that just seems to be part and parcel of the way it is now. It's, it's not enough for somebody to just be the Zodiac killer. They have to have all this other stuff attached to it, too. And, and if you look at, at 
Edward Wayne Edwards, who wasn't a good guy by any stretch of the imagination, if you look at him initially, you know, you look at him, he might be a, a possible suspect. But then if you look at that whole story, and I didn't watch the show, I, I only know it was in it based on what I read, you know, they're connecting to every other crime under the sun, including the John Bonet Ramsey case, right. I think the West Memphis Three. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to look at it as a whole and, and use common sense and say, wait a minute. If if I know in my mind that guy didn't do all this stuff, did he do the Zodiac? You start looking, you have to start looking closer and and see if you know there's no way all this stuff's possible, then is it even possible that he was really Zodiac? And you have to zero in and look at the claims and and you know, see what you can decide what's real and what's not at that point. Well, and I think a lot of that, too, is it, so much of that adding on, the padding of the resume is filler because if you if they just presented you with the information they have that makes it seem like he's the Zodiac, it doesn't seem like that much. But you add on all this other stuff, and it's kind of trying to overwhelm people to the point where he must be guilty of something, right? He must be involved in at least one of these things, when in reality, if you looked at the evidence for each individual crime, there's almost nothing there. And it's almost, you know, almost the case of the bigger the lie, the more people that believe it. So they're throwing every case under the sun against him, hoping something sticks and hoping at least the Zodiac part will stick and they actually can make a show out of it. And, you know, it's, in my mind, it's, it's a little bit funny, but, um, you know, out there there's a lot of people that actually watch that show and believe that he's the Zodiac. Yeah. And it helps, it's very sensational. It helps sell newspapers and advertising for TV shows. The more sensational the claim is, the more likely people are to watch it. It's very, it's very contagious. The, uh, you know, the excitement over, hey, someone might have solved the case, and it, you know, it, it spreads really fast. And does that reminds me of that saying, you know, a lie will get around the world while the truth is still putting its pants on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's very true. No, no one wants to watch a show about, you know, somebody. <clears throat> well, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong, and actually, you know, that that can't be true. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Just deflates yeah. everybody's, you know, excitement over these stories, and that's what it kind of boils down to. Is that people are more interested in the, these stories being told than the actual truth of it. Yeah. I was just a little uh, disturbed. I mean, I used to just kind of um, watch these uh, for the in do the interviews and things to be informed on who I'm interviewing. But I'm, I'm getting a little disturbed by the amount of people that actually come up to me and have seen shows like that, mm -hmm. and they think it's like real news. Like, did you hear? Is <laughs> you know, did you hear? Yeah. And it's like, well, as if it's true, and it's something they saw on TV, and it's a documentary, so it's real. Well, it's much easier to convince someone than it is to unconvince them. So if they watched a show or saw a movie or read a book or went to a website or something that laid out the trivia that makes someone seem guilty, when someone else comes along, like like Dave was saying, it's kind of a downer. <laughs> people don't People aren't as entertained when you're like, well, I'm sorry, that part isn't actually true, and that never happened, or that piece of evidence isn't what they're claiming it is. You know, it just rains on people's parade. And I think there's a certain amount of that sensationalism that's exciting and entertaining. And, you know, I, I'm, I haven't seen that show either. Um, I recorded it, and I can't bring myself to commit to five hours of that material um, because I doubt that there's anything in it that's going to be useful or new. But at the same time, it goes back to what I was saying before about the, the standards. If, if you have very low standards, then it's very easy to be convinced that somebody like Edward Wayne Edwards was the Zodiac, when in reality, you know, if we were presenting this to a, an investigator in a law enforcement agency, they'd probably laugh you out of the room. And instead of, you know, laughing you out of the room, you get a five-part TV show. <laughs> That's there's something wrong with that. Yeah. And it's it's not anything new either. The funny thing is, if you look at, you know, there's a guy named George Hodel who's whose son Steve Hodel accused him of being the Zodiac, and also accused him of being the Black Dahlia murderer, and uh, I think a couple other killings he claimed. The he Chicago did. lipstick killer. The Los yeah, I mean, if you, but if you look at the facts, you, you know, they've got these descriptions which are pretty wide of Zodiac being, you know, 
25 to 45 years old. It's a big range. But, like, Steve Hodel was 60 or, um, George Hodel was 60 years old, 65 years old or something when Zodiac was doing that. So you have to, you know, narrow it down. So, right, if, if this guy's 65, how does he fall into a 25 to 45 year range? You know, it's just, it's laughable some of the claims that are made. And, you know, it's just proof that these bigger the, the claims, the more people believe them. Uh, it, it's not new. It's just because of the power of television and, and internet and stuff, we can blast this to a bigger audience faster. But that's been something that's been going on since the beginning of this case is people trying to make all these outrageous, outrageous claims. Yeah, yeah, there seems to be no end in it. Um, <laughs> and that, that brings me to the next. It's the, um, the actual suspects. Um, there seems to be so many of them, and this is a very confusing thing for a lot of people that uh, come to us as a crime show, and, and we get a lot of emails and communications and stuff. How many legitimate suspects do we have? Um, it's a big thing to tackle, I know, because it seems to be endless. But with you guys, what's what's the bottom line on suspects? How many do we have that are reasonably uh, a good possibility? Uh, you know, for me, I've and I've looked at a lot of them because that's one of my favorite parts of the case is sort of digging into people and seeing who could be a legitimate suspect. You know, there's a key difference between person of interest and suspect. You know, a person of interest is somebody that the police is interested in because they might fit some criteria, or a suspect is somebody that the police actually suspect could be the perpetrator. So these terms get thrown around, person of interest, suspect, you know, among online, you know, people investigating this case that are, you know, they're strictly armchair detectives, uh, citizen detectives, whatever term you want to use, but they start throwing around the, the terms POIs, suspects, and a lot of times none of these people really are considered by police to be um, suspects, but they get called in, they email them tips, and they almost have to, you know, they're obligated to take some information on them. Um, and, and you look at some, some cases over the years of some of the different suspects, and I think Mike's got a, has done a good job on his uh, site of refuting some of the stuff. Um, there's, there's definitely some interesting people along the way, but there's some that, you know, shouldn't probably even rise to the, the term suspect. I think he could probably touch on that. Well, that's, you brought up a good point about how there's a difference between POI and, and a suspect, and there's also a difference between those two categories and someone who merely stands accused by at least one individual. <laughs> and that's usually what we're talking about. We're not usually talking about anybody who's been, who the police believe is a person of interest or who the police actually suspect of committing a crime. We're usually just talking about someone who at least one person has accused in public. And so I don't usually call them suspects. I usually just refer to them as the accused and the accusers. Um, but there, you know, there are a few people who were legitimate suspects that were investigated by law enforcement. There's people like Arthur Lee Allen and Larry Kane and people like that. Um, and then there's other people who have sort of been around in the periphery of things for a while. Um, people like Ross Sullivan, who... Uh, came up as a suspect a long time ago and whose name has been around but has more recently gotten some attention. And um, I think Mike's probably uh, more qualified to talk about Ross Sullivan than I am. He's done a lot more research in that regard. But someone like Arthur Lee Allen, we've talked about uh, him on the on previous episodes of the Zodiac Files show, um, where you know he became a suspect in the early 1970s because... Uh, an estranged friend came forward and said, you know, before the Zodiac crimes occurred, he told me he wanted to commit these kinds of crimes and that he was going to write letters calling himself the Zodiac. And police investigated, and the, the Vallejo police and the San Francisco police investigated, and although they found some information which was interesting, what you might call some minor trivia about things, that he had some interest in some codes and, um, had made some, possibly made some statements that were similar to the text of Zodiac letters, 
the police got a search warrant. They searched his trailer. They compared his fingerprints, and they didn't match. They had a handwriting expert examine his handwriting, handwriting produced by both of his hands because he was amb ambidextrous. Um, and they found no evidence linking him to the Zodiac crimes. And essentially, they abandoned him as a suspect and moved on. And years later, that same individual became the subject of a best-selling book, although his name was changed to a pseudonym. Um, and then, of course, the information that was in that book was not always necessarily accurate or true, and that convinced the public that Arthur Lee Allen must have been the Zodiac, or at the very least, he was the best suspect, the prime suspect, and that's how he's often referred to as the prime suspect. When in reality, the friend who had first reported Allen uh, in later years embellished and added to his stories and basically destroyed what remained of his credibility and cast doubt on his claims to the point where even some original investigators were uh, doubting his credibility and the veracity of his claims. And I interviewed that individual several times, and he made several statements to me that made it very clear that he was the kind of person who was willing to embellish or invent facts in order to make Allen seem guilty. And we discovered that he had once accused Allen of attempting to molest one of his children and that that might have been a reason why he could have invented this story or at the very least exaggerated aspects of it. And so today Arthur Lee Allen still talked about as a prime suspect when in reality every time they find some evidence in the Zodiac case, it doesn't match Allen, whether that's handwriting or fingerprints or a palm print or DNA or uh, descriptions by uh, victims or uh, witnesses. Um, all of the evidence that we have appears to exclude him, and in the end we're left with just some minor in bits of trivia or information which may have seemed compelling a long time ago, but when you compare it with all the exculpatory evidence, there's no good reason to refer to him as the prime suspect. Now, I should say, it's possible Arthur Lee Allen was the Zodiac. It's just that's not what the evidence indicates. And if someone were to come forward with information that proved Allen was the Zodiac, I think all of us would be thrilled that the case was finally solved. So there, some people might think that, you know, opinions about suspects are based on your opinions of the people who accuse them. And sometimes that may be relevant, but for the most part, with somebody, someone like Arthur Lee Allen, you're talking about somebody who's basically become a prime suspect in the minds of the public, mm -hmm. largely through the influence of the media, and not through credible evidence or any uh, real suspicions by investigators, although people in the Vallejo Police Department continue to consider him a viable suspect, and um, there's other people who think he was the Zodiac. I just don't believe the evidence indicates that he was the Zodiac, and I think it's probably more prudent to move on to other suspects, even if you're going to still consider Allen as viable. Someone else like Ross Sullivan, who has become uh, more well-known recently, um, there's a lot of information that's known about him in the public and a lot of information that isn't. So maybe Mike could uh, explain a little bit more about the history of Ross Sullivan and why people think he's the Zodiac. Yeah, so... You know, Ross Sullivan was a name that, uh, as Mike mentioned, was in some old reports uh, online uh, going back into the 90s when, when the Internet first fired up. I think there was a defunct Google News site for the Zodiac case, and his name was mentioned on there. Um, and I, you know, I went back through a bunch of old names. I went through names and reports. I was looking at every piece of information I could get about a lot of different suspects. And his name was one that I just wanted to check out. And then we had found that there was some information about him in Riverside, which is a whole other chapter we can get into. Uh, but down in Southern California, he had ties to the to the college down there that ties into the case. Um, and I said, you know, let's try and see who this guy is and see if we can find a picture of him. And, um, you know, we, we got a picture of a man I mean, a couple people set out to get a picture of him, and we came up with a picture of him, and I, I saw it, and I thought I was looking at the sketch of the Zodiac, uh, because I'm like, this looks just like the Zodiac. Um, so for me, and, you know, I don't put a lot of stock into the sketch, but at the same time, if somebody looks identical to a sketch, it's hard to not, you know, see that, especially when they tie into uh, another piece of the case, 
um, uh, that is possibly related to the Zodiac case, which he does. Um, there's a lot that's not known about him. He's a guy that we know he was in San Jose at certain points. Um, we don't, we can't put him in Vallejo or Napa or San Francisco. Although there's, he had a family member in San Francisco that thought he was Zodiac, and there's a somebody that knew them that said that Ross did spend some time in San Francisco. Um, but you know, they're just like any other person that's accused. There's things that are missing. You know, there's certain missing pieces of the puzzle. Um, so, and that's why I'm thankful for DNA because. I'm hoping that they can put DNA in that database the way they do with the Golden State Killer and all these other cases. And if it's good enough, it's going to lead to the right person. It's not going to be a question of if or, you know, and. Uh, it's going to be legitimately the right person. And then we can find out without, you know, any kind of, um, you know, argument of who this was. So whether it's Arthur Lee Allen or Ross Sullivan or whoever it is, you know, I personally would just like to know, and then we can end the end the debate. Yeah, and if you don't mind me asking, because I, I get asked this all the time, um, Mike, what, what would you say to people who uh, bring up, you know, they say that Ross is too big to be the Zodiac, or that he didn't drive, and things like that? Well, you know, we have a witness that knew him and his brother that said he did drive, so I immediately look at that and say, okay, you know, he did drive. Um, you know, one thing about Ross is he's he was six foot two, and most of the claims uh, of Zodiac were under six feet. But, you know, I also look at the people that judged his height. You know, one of them is Mike Mijot, who's sitting in a car while Zodiac's standing outside shooting at him with a light in his face. I wonder if, if he's a good judge of height. You know, other witnesses are the, the kids on Washington and Cherry looking down across from, you know, an upstairs window looking down at Paul Stein's cab. How are they going to judge accurate height? Um, you know, so the height part, it doesn't really, uh, you know, because there's not a good witness that saw him on level ground, um, you know, that doesn't, you know, this sway me that much. Yeah. The weight issue, you know, I know he was in his 260s in um, 1968, 1969, um, because I found a witness that encountered him and, and gave a very good description of him. And he said he wasn't blubbery fat. He was a solid, stocky 260 pounds. And when you see pictures of him, um, that are they're from 1959. We don't know of any pictures of them around 1969, but he was described as being fat. And I'm looking at those pictures. I'm like, that guy's not fat. He's pretty solid. He's sort of like a like a a football player. Um, you know, so I think people have this misconception that he's um, some overweight guy that just can't even get up a hill or go out and shoot people. Um, when in reality, you know. In what we've been described from people that saw him in the pictures we've seen, you know, he's a solid, stocky guy. Um, you know, so I wouldn't let the physical description alone, you know, rule him out. Yeah. If anything, you know, if DNA rules him out, that's one thing. You know, but we've seen that sketches can be wrong. Um, but as it stands, he is the best likeness to the sketch I've ever seen. And I've looked at hundreds of <laughs> hundreds of people. Um, and then we tie him to that Riverside library, you know, where Zodiac's writing was discovered. Um, the problem is that's A and Z. It's the, it's the rest of the alphabet in between that we can't connect all the dots. Um, so for me, that's why I, I sort of stopped short of saying, you know, this is the guy because I, I think there's too many things in between that need to be connected first. But, but again, for DNA, I think that will come down and, and solve a lot of uh, arguments. Well, and that's also the major issue that comes up all the time, too, is not necessarily that you're convinced that someone is the Zodiac. It's that you want to do what any investigator would do, which is rule them out or rule them in. And you don't want to continue wasting time on someone what if you can prove they're not the killer? So the the best thing to do is to try to prove they're not, and that's to keep investigating. Um, I think the, some listeners may not know that didn't Ross Sullivan die in nineteen seventy seven? 
Is that right? Yeah, he died in 1977. And, and unfortunately, the time frame of when Zodiac was writing letters is, you know, between 1969 and 1974. And that's the five-year gap where we don't know where Ross Sullivan was. We know he was in Santa Cruz in 1968. We know he died in 1977 in Santa Cruz. So some people have said, well, he was never out of Santa, Santa Cruz. That's where he was at, at the whole time. But we don't know that. His own brother who lived in San Francisco at one point thought he was Zodiac. So why would you think his brother was Zodiac if he didn't live in San Francisco? And then we also look at, on his death certificate, it stated that he was a resident of Santa Cruz for three years. And mm -hmm. so that would date back to 1974. And that's when the last Zodiac letter was mailed. So if he had been there the whole time, why didn't say he was a resident for nine years or ten years? So, but we can't say for sure where he was during the Zodiac period. And that's, that's troubling when you're trying to dig for information on somebody. Now, if he was, I don't know if you know if he was cremated or buried, but if they were trying to obtain DNA to compare to Zodiacs today, how would they go about that for Ross Sullivan? Well, he was, he was definitely cremated, but he does have a living relative who's not cooperative. He doesn't want any part of clearing his uh, brother's name. Um, but there's other family members um, that will. And eventually, whether his brother is willing to, to get DNA or not, if the GEDmatch DNA database works, it won't matter because if, if they connect a third, fourth cousin, whatever, last name Sullivan, Sullivan yeah. and they link it, it, it wouldn't matter. It would it trace to him and they'd find out he's most likely Zodiac anyways, even yeah. without having his DNA. But... Um, that's why DNA almost is, is the most powerful tool that we have. If you know, it'll end any kind of discussion, any kind of debate, and they will if they can get a sample that's good enough. We'll find out for sure who Zodiac really is. So, you know, that's why I'm so high on the on the DNA. Well, DNA can be the great equalizer. <laughs> but absolutely. <hopefully> it, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, we're wrapping up this episode. We'll be back tomorrow, and we're going to be talking about ciphers. To find out more about our show, guests, or listen to a previous show, visit our website at www.somethingweirdmedia.com. show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.